Well, oh my goodness, I'm happy. So um, I'm going to talk about this, which was sort of an interesting journey for me. Uh, I started writing this book five years ago. It came out last year uh, from Princeton University Press. And uh, I first started talking about it two years ago, and uh, some of the audience started crying. <laughs> so uh, maybe it's a better day to try it out. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. And it really was just an experiment. I actually, uh, I, I got a sabbatical and I went to work as a theorist. I'm an experimental, experimental nanoscientist, and I'm not really going to talk too much about that today. But I went and worked with a theory group in uh, San Sebastian in the Basque Country in Spain. And I just, I, I'd, I'd worked for the first 10 years of my career in uh, industry, in IBM and Hitachi, and my own spin-out companies. And then I came into the universities. So I never, never dreamt I would ever become an academic, because my father was an academic. And if anything ever teaches you never to do becoming an academic, it's that. And, and then, you know, I, I eventually found myself back in, in academia. And uh, what struck me was how many people complained. It's an amazing job being an academic. You have amazing freedom. And yet everybody complained about it. And, um, you know, they're going to, I'm going to a conference. Oh, how terrible. You know, I don't really want to go. Well, why are you going? Well, I have to go. Well, why do you have to go? Because well, I have to do the next thing. Um, and so I started thinking about uh, the system that we find ourselves in. And, and that's what I started to do uh, through the sabbatical. I just started thinking about the system that we're in. And I would sort of found myself a little bit as an outsider, because an industry person, you sort of come into to university, and everything is really peculiar, how it works. And if you ask anybody, why does it work that way, they look at you very strangely. Uh, and it just does. So this is really um, a bit of a story of uh, you know, why I wrote this book. And, and it really was supposed to be called uh, How Science Really Works, the real emphasis on the, on the really. And it's also partly because I got tired of the, the sort of storyline that we always get in the media of how science is the lone individual fighting against the system who comes up with a brilliant idea. Because in my experience, that's not how science works at all. Um, it's teams, it's interactions, it's lots of different things. And yet that rhetoric is sort of a lot of the times edited out of the media. So I didn't want to write this book with any stories in it. Of course, though, nobody's bought it. That that's, <laughs> tells you how the media works. Um, so I want to start with, with, with this, really. So um, the first question is, where does technology come from? So the sort of technologies in our, in our mobile, mobile phone, well, where do they really come from? So you can think about things like um, the uh, organic light-emitting diode displays. This is just a, a, you know, it's just a current chip, but it's just to remind you how amazing technology is. So there's sort of displays or the displays in our, our projectors. So the organic light-emitting diodes, well, where did it really come from? Well, actually, you know, in the 1860s, you had people in, in France who were trying to investigate molecules called polyaniline, so uh, uh, um, polymers, so long wrapped up chains of different molecules where charges can hop around and protons can go in and out. And they tried putting electric currents on it, and they saw strange changes. The colors changed of these different systems. Um, and they, they certainly weren't doing it because they were trying to make a technology. They were doing it just because they were interested in it. Uh, and that sort of developed, and in fact, uh, you had Kodak very involved in the 1980s. And then it, the Cavendish labs of Richard Friend and Jeremy Burroughs. So there was a big activity here. And eventually, it made it into technology. But certainly, that wasn't how it started out. Or if you like the memory devices here, which are generally a tiny chunk of metal, which you just shovel on some electrons. And then when you pass a current through a little bit of silicon underneath, it gets squished. The current gets turned off if there's too many electrons repelling the, the, the transporting electrons underneath. So you, you store charge on this floating gate. You've got to get it on and off. And actually, the electrons, and often they, uh, they, they zip away, and you have to measure them and put them back again. So this is how your bank account is stored, by the way. So you should worry about the physics very deeply. Also about spinning electrons that we don't really understand either. That's the magnetic recording. Um, but this was, you know, it was all basic science. And in fact, uh, you know, it was all done, you know, in, 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 a lot of it was done in Bell Labs in the early uh, uh, 50s and 60s and thought about a lot before then as well. Or the accelerometers. So the accelerometers in our, in our phones came from people uh, actually looking at the basic physical properties of germanium and trying to twist germanium and say, oh, look, there's some charge that develops, a voltage that develops. And that eventually gave us tiny little beams of silicon, which when you shake them, produce a voltage. And that's how uh, Google can track whether you're walking upstairs or downstairs or whatever you're doing, sitting down too much, probably. 
Um, or even Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi, so which we completely depend on, well, it might have come from Maxwell's equations in the 1860s and, and, and then. But, but actually, uh, it was some really clever work at the CSRO in, in Australia that figured out a way to maximize the bandwidth, so to actually keep on moving the information through different bands and utilize it in a way that really allows all of you to, to, to Twitter my talk, which you're supposed to be doing, uh, by the way. So that, um, you know, it wouldn't work otherwise. So all of these are, this was for astronomy, right? So they were trying to be able to maximize the radio telescopes that they had and get the information out of it. And they found some very neat ways of doing this co correlation that were mathematically, uh, uh, well, you could use them in very profound ways that actually then were the things that you could um, use for Wi-Fi allocation. So I think it's really clear where technology comes from. Technology comes from basic science. I mean, almost everything we do comes from basic science. But where does basic science come from? And uh, we sort of take it for granted that the, the, the science, the health of the science uh, system that we're in is in good shape. And this is sort of where I started out. So uh, how do we actually know if science is in good shape? How would we measure it? So there's always people complaining. As I said, that's the major thing you get in universities. But probably that was the case 20 years ago and 20 years before that. And probably you can find Maxwell complaining about his colleagues and ad nauseam. But, but, but that doesn't mean it's good or bad. So we should have some way of trying to think about whether the science system as a whole uh, is in good shape. And so there are some questions about what the problems are, and I'm going to try and talk about that a bit. And also, uh, what's the best way to think about it? And that was one of the things that I found from this book, is that one of the really useful metaphors to think about the system of science is really an ecosystem. So there's a huge amount of developed work now on how ecosystems work and how you should think about them. And that has been really useful um, when thinking about science itself. So, I mean, the first question might be, um, what sorts of scientists are there? We're going to start with this one. Um, so I liked to actually design, divide science into a couple of different domains. And I'm talking very broadly about science, and you'll see science engineering altogether. Um, so there is actually uh, quite a good definition of who a scientist is. We'll talk about that a bit later. But it seems to me there's two sorts of ways of thinking about science. Um, one of them is what I would call a simplifier. So a simplifier is that dreadful kid who takes apart everything to find out how it works. Uh, including the cat, uh, the vacuum cleaner, whatever it is. Um, but it's that sense of taking things apart to figure out how does it work? How does the natural world work? Uh, it, it ends up with this sort of thing, uh, where you're still trying to take things apart, but it got a bit more expensive and more difficult to do. Uh, and you're trying to take you know, single protons apart or single electrons apart to see how the structure of matter uh, is made. So that's one sort of scientist, and it, it's all across science, you know, from biology. How does consciousness work? How do neurons work? Um, so it, it's just pervasive. Um, but the other side of, of science I would call constructor science. Uh, and so I'm a constructor scientist. And we can ask, you know, are there more simplifiers or more constructors? And constructors often say, oh, well, if that's how it works, what happens if I do this with this? It's at that moment uh, where you're starting to become a constructor scientist, because often you've got to go away and do that. And in some ways, this is a better dichotomy than, say, applied science and pure science. It's, a very, it's quite a German way of doing it, where they divide departments into pure and applied, and you can't step between those two boundaries. Um, because, uh, you know, there are, there are people all through science and engineering in different ways. You might, you might be an engineer in simplifier science, and you might be a constructor in a maths department. What happens if I put this together with that, and what will come out of it? Uh, and you can see that because uh, a lot of the Gedanken experiments that came in the 20s for thinking about quantum mechanics were... Well, what happens if I have two identical particles that I put in this way? Or, or Schrodinger's famous experiment, where, you know, the thought experiment, where there's a cat in the box and the nuclei decays and it fires the gun and the cat may be alive or dead. But of course, nobody actually did an experiment like that. But it stimulated people to think about, well, how would I build an experiment? And now, 100 years later, we effectively do build experiments exactly like that where we can try and make something big and complicated, like a big protein molecule exist in two states at once, or, you know, either here or here, very peculiar sorts of states. 
So we, we, we have these, yeah, so the constructors, if you like, they build out into the unknown. They'll be making things that aren't necessarily in nature, but come from asking these questions of nature. So, okay, if it does that, how do you make this work? So we have both simplifiers and constructors in our science ecosystem. It's always a surprise me what's next. Um, so we'll come back to this, because this is you know, an amazing assembly of constructor science. That's what I was trying to get to at the start when I was showing how many. I mean, there are, there are really enormous numbers of technologies under this. And it comes from simplifier science, which suggested constructor science. And then if you look back at that particle accelerator, well, that allowed you to build completely new things. We now make things like superconductors, which don't exist in nature, which allow you to make enormous coils, which generate enormous magnetic fields, which now enable you to take a particle at very, very high speed, near the speed of light, around 20 kilometer loops, which allows you to collide them to understand more about basic material, the characteristics of matter. So we need constructor science to do more simplifier science. So it's a very, you know, it's like a feedback. So in fact, if you want to, you can define two axes. You have uh, the simplifier axis here and the constructor axis this way, here. And each piece of science is somewhere in this domain here. It might start out as simplifier science, and then it might gradually over time move into constructor science, and then might come back. And you might say the impact might be how far away from the origin it is. Of course, it's nice that S is sine theta and C is cos theta for simplifiers and constructors, and then the angle is the stance of science, whether it's sort of more simplifier or constructor, so you can, you can put some mathematics in it if you like. Um, but so, yeah, and some stuff just goes down into the origin. It's neither interesting nor pervasive. Um, so, so, so we might think about, yes, how many, how many constructors are there versus how many simplifiers? We might also ask, actually, how many scientists are there in the world. So many of you have been scientists. So, so there's a the good definition of science, which is sort of accepted for trying to do this sort of counting by, by UNESCO and a number of other bodies, and that's people who are creating new scientific knowledge that can be used. And that means that it's not somebody on a, on a say, a production line who's tweaking the process. You know, if you're slightly tweaking a process, trying to get it working better, that's not really creating new knowledge, it's just optimizing. Um, but you might be doing things where you're working out how you're going to do things on a process line that's creating new knowledge, and that would absolutely be science. So it's quite a broad and well-defined definition, and you can use that to count how many scientists there are in the world. So probably many of you are scientists. I bet you don't know how many there are of you. And it's sort of surprising, because if I go to my colleagues, you know, I'm, I'm occasionally called a physicist, although I'm a nanoscientist, so I resist it like the plague. But if I ask, you know, how many physicists in the world are there? We just need well to find. No physicist knows, really. How many people are you competing against, even your area? People find it very hard to know this. Is it going up or is it going down? Is it always staying about flat? So these things became uh, really interesting to me. So um, one of the things that I did to try and understand how many simplifiers and constructors there were was I, I mean, you can't count. You can't, for instance, go to a journal article and ask, is this a simplifier or a constructor without re uh, simplifier science or constructor science without really reading it? And often it will be both, but, but by and large you can separate them, but you have to read it. You can't separate them in any other way that I've ever found. So that's really quite hard if to try and count. So what I did was I went and had a look at the last 60 years of Nobel Prizes across the, the areas of science. And it's sort of interesting what you find. The first thing, well, what, one interesting thing is that um, the number of, uh, I'm trying to get this right. So in, in, in the first sort of 50 years from the, uh, or 30 years from the, the um, uh, 40s or so, the, about 70% of physics Nobel Prizes were in simplifier science. So these are some of the major discoveries, some of the particle physics discoveries, superconductivity, the FET, the electron trans the transistors, uh, quantum Hall effect, all sorts of effects like that. So, um, so some of that simplifier science, about 75% of it was simplifier science uh, and 30% constructor science. And over the last sort of, the most recent sort of 25 years, that's much more balanced. It's about 50-50. So the amount of simplifier science has been going down as we basically no more. 
So you might worry about, you know, does simplifier science end? But the whole point is that constructor science means that you're creating new materials that have incredibly strange properties that nobody would have ever thought of before. So there's always more there. That's, it's never going to run out. Uh, on the other hand, actually, chemistry might have gone a little bit in the opposite direction because, you know, chemists started out really in that idea of using their science. They were very much uh, connected to these big German chemicals companies that were developing new, new science. And then it, it, it came more into the biosciences. So in other areas, actually, in medicine, for instance, they still don't know anything, is how I would say. So it's about 70%, 70 Nobel Prizes in simplifier science, and that's still about 70%. So every time you figure you thought you knew something, there's just more surprises there. What, but one of the interesting things about reading these is that a very few of the scientists doing it realized that their work had implications at the time for technology. So this is one of the things we always try and tell politicians. It's just, it's just not obvious that what you're doing is profound. You'd like to believe it was profound, but almost nobody knows that at the time. It's just interesting and going in new directions. So that's maybe... That's maybe heartening. Uh, so, the, yeah, the sort of science that I do uh, is, is humbled by the ant. Maybe that's the best way of putting it. Uh, so this is an unbelievably exquisite piece of nanoscience or nanotechnology, if that's one way of looking at it. And I cannot tell you how hopeless we are at trying to do anything like this. So I've become more and more interested now in making uh, nanomachinery. So there are certain things that we can do very well. Uh, so an ant can smell very well, well, it's an antenna, but I can actually make something now that will detect individual molecules. And in fact, I'm trying to do it to build intelligent toilets that will go in your house to measure some of the neurotransmitters in your urine, sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, and the cannabinoids and various other things you might not want to tell me about. Um, so so that's, the sensors are things that actually we're getting better at. So... We can maybe try and compete a little bit. But in terms of motion, in terms of moving nanomachines around, we always have these great scenarios from science fiction of nanobots, right? Do we have any nano? We're hopeless. We can't make anything like that. So in terms of locomotion or communication, that's unbelievably uh, good. So that's what I try and do. And they, um, so I'm very much a constructor, trying to see how can I make strong forces on the nanoscale that will move things around in water, which is effectively like treacle on our scales. It's very, very difficult to move things around on the nanoscale. Okay. So now we'll talk about the number of scientists again. So let's have a show of hands. How many people think the number of scientists is about staying level? It's not really changing too much. Yeah. Okay. Never be put off by your neighbor. How many people think it's going up? How many people think it's going down? Fine, right. You get outvoted, I'm sorry. Um, okay, if it's going up, is it going up faster than the population of the world or less than the population of the world? How many people think more than the population of the world is going up? And how many people think less than the population of the world going up? Okay, so it's more difficult, that one, isn't it? Um, so the, so I'm, I'm, you'll have to read the book to find out how many scientists there are. I'm not going to give away everything. That would be terrible. There are some things down here at the front if you want to get uh, cheaper copies of the book, by the way. Um, no, so, so the number of scientists is going up at about just over 4% a year. Okay. Uh, the world population is now, we're at an amazing stage. All of you are at an amazing stage of life because the world population has been going up less than a percent a year now. It's dropped, I think, 0.8% per year increase. So we're well past the point of inflection. It's really getting uh, slower. It's, it's impressive. But the number of scientists shows no sign of changing. It's been going up a 4.5% a year for the last 50 or 60 years and shows no signs of stopping at all. So let's think about that. That means that the number of scientists in the world doubles every 20 years. Those of you who are a little on the older side can think about whether that sounds about right. You've seen a quadrupling or more of the number of scientists, but it sounds about right. Uh, that's pretty terrifying to me. What do all those new scientists do? Right? Do they, does, so you can imagine, so we, we really are pushing more and more people into science. So we can ask, uh, do they do science faster? That's one possibility if you put more people in. Or do they discover things more quickly? So 
Are major discoveries gone through more quickly? Or do we look at more areas? You know, what's the effect on doing that in the science ecosystem? So it's interesting that this number is not really known. We don't really think about it. And yet, actually, it drives a lot of the behavior in this ecosystem of science that I want to tell you a bit more about. Um, so I guess we all know what happens. Many of you have been in small companies, seen small companies transition to larger companies. Uh, other of you have been in small communities and see them get bigger. So there's a typical difficulty that happens around 25 people. Uh, when you get above 25 people, it stops being natural just to talk to each other. And there start being conflicts and, and divisions, right? Maybe that's why all teams are well smaller than that. You know, 15 in a team for sports, not 50 in a team for any sport. Um, and then there's another number, which is sometimes called Dunbar's number after a, a sociologist in, in Oxford, uh, which is sort of the, the size of a tribe or a, a, Russian co a, a, a Roman cohort. Or It's a set of people that you can organize together relatively easily because you can get them all aligned in the same direction. And bigger than that, again, it gets much more difficult. So this is one of the difficulties about organizing in science is that how do we do it as the number of scientists are growing so fast? So you can think about it in some ways that um, we have communities in science which might be uh, small communities in a particular discipline or in a particular community in an area or physically located together. And as the number of scientists grows, they just become harder to manage, harder to have these loyalties of people. So really feel like a community and mentor people. So this is something that's emerging, I think, as a problem. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, you know, why science might look like an ecosystem. So we, we're used to ecosystems. Say there's a water cycle, something like that. Um, we might actually think about how we have people in science. So that's one of the real resources in science as being a bit like this water cycle. So we have young people who emerge. Uh, and I would say that almost everybody at the age of five is a natural scientist. They just ask these questions of why. That's the endlessly troublesome uh, young daughter, in my case. Why does it do that, right? So everybody has that, and eventually we beat it out of them. So you're resilient, I guess, all of you. Um, but so they, they come down and we train them. So we, we sort of, they, they, they come into little rivers and they start to grow. The science knowledge starts to increase. We, we teach them. We might take off some of that flow now into, we'll take them, we'll educate them in a university, and then we'll take them off into an industry. And so we'll harness them. That's the water, the water mills of uh, our society. We'll take off some of, some of them and uh, we'll use them to educate some of the others. And at the end, that knowledge gets evaporated back into the sky and teaches the next cohort. So this is a cycle of science as it goes, as it goes round. So we have all these different uh, aspects. And now we, you know, this web of knowledge is becoming more clear in our minds as we actually physically have a web. But there are other sort of things that we can imagine. So um, almost all processes on Earth are stimulated by the energy from the sun. So coming in, that energy input on the surface of the Earth is what drives almost everything in the natural world. So let's think about the ecosystem of science. What is it that really drives everything in science? And unfortunately, I have to say it's really money. Uh, because th that resource is just crucial for everything that we do in, in, in science. And uh, in the, the sun, you know, mostly it's got the same sort of thermal load. We have slight fluctuations in the planet. But actually, the investment in science on our planet has ever been going upwards. So although everybody complains about it's terrible, there's never been more money in science. Okay? Because it's the one thing that politicians will agree to fund, because the general public has a very, very high regard for science. So no politician will f find it difficult to convince somebody that they should put more money into science. So that's why the science budget grows. We might ask, how much money should we spend on science? If you, if you look at um, the science budget in every country, it goes up to a certain amount and then it stops. There's a certain level of GDP, a couple of percent of GDP. And we might ask, well, if science is so good at generating technology and jobs and our welfare, why, why, don't, we, why don't we make it 20%? Or if we actually don't believe it, why don't, we, why don't we halve it? Is it an accident we're at exactly the optimum amount of money that we should be putting into science? 
So the answer is, no, it's very unlikely. I think, as far as I can see, I mean, there's no, nobody really understands what the right amount is to put in there. You have these people competing to, to increase it, so different nations in the EU will always be competing and, and around the world about how much money they put into science. And the UK government has just committed to, to almost double science technology spend in the UK, which is incredibly impressive. Um, but, you know, in the face of what evidence? It's really, we, we like to be evidence-based, right? Um, and uh, I think what happens, in fact, is that eventually it makes it onto the single page of how a country spends its money. And then somebody in the Treasury goes, OK, what are we getting for that? And you go, well, you know, we're getting a long-term future. Hmm. And that's where it sticks. It just sticks. As soon as it appears on a single sheet, that's where it sticks. So that's why we spend that amount of money on science. Uh, some other things that uh, we were, well, I was already talking about water. Something like the water cycle is, is people, which are also the lifeblood of science, if you like. Um, then there's something that really helps science, which is freedom. So there are many analogies here, but I like the one of soil. So soil is what we need to grow things in the natural ecosystem. It's the bedrock of everything. And freedom is sort of that for science. If in anything constrained, science tends to go very badly astray. Um, and then this one here. So um, nutrients, so all of these cycles of nutrients are a bit like the infrastructure that we have, computing infrastructure, lab-based infrastructures, large facilities. So we really need all of that for science. It has to be there at the start. And the universities are part of that infrastructure too. So when you come from industry, university is a miracle. How did anybody ever invent a university? If you were inventing a science system from scratch... A university is not what you would make, I don't think. Uh, and yet, we have it as a legacy from the way it's emerged from our cultures. And I don't think we think about it in those terms. So there are many other analogies as well. Uh, you can, for instance, look at climate. So the climate is like the politics. It changes very slowly. Uh, but politics changing does change what goes into science. And then maybe uh, weather, our day-to-day conditions, are more like science bandwagons. So one of the answers to this question, what happens when you fund a lot more people, is they all go and do the same thing faster, and they hate each other, and they have more arguments about it. So it does progress science a bit faster, but it's all bottlenecked into certain regions of science which are sort of hot. And that's a bit more like sort of this turbulence of the weather. Uh, and then habitats are a bit like institutions. We have diversity and biodiversity. Uh, we have carbon fixation. We have no knowledge fixing into our sort of, we'll talk more about this sort of knowledge, this web of knowledge that we have, um, genes and memes. So yeah, well, we can talk about more of them. So the thing that I mostly got out of really trying to look in, 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 in some detail at drawing this ecosystem boundaries, and we'll, we'll talk about what's inside, is this idea of uh, resilience and diversity. So particular diversity is very, very important for natural ecosystems. So, uh, you know, a system might look healthy, but it's starting to lose diversity. And if there are shocks coming from outside or challenges, then it tends to respond in sometimes catastrophic ways. And so one of the questions that I've been asking here is, you know, what is our diversity like? And are we doing well or not? So, uh, paradoxically, in, in the book, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm interested in is, uh, I always thought a globalization was a good thing. So with globalization, knowledge just goes around the world. Surely that's good for science. But what also happens is the way that we fund science, the way that we do science, becomes more and more similar now in every country. So all countries that are putting investment into science, they're not saying, oh, we're going to do it a completely different way. We're going to do it our way. Well, sometimes they'll say that, and then it's exactly the same system. So you have grants and peer reviews, and we'll select some special areas that only our country will do, just happens to be quantum technology and AI, and you know, it's all the same ones. So what we actually do in this is we reduce diversity. So one of the things that I've become more and more interested in is actually how important anarchy is. And funding things in different ways, for instance, exploring new ways of doing things. I used to hate it. Why are we changing? And now I'm a convinced anarchist. And in fact, it's my role in the university is creative anarchy, as most of my administrators will tell you. So the science ecosystem, I'm just going to give you, you know, it's a very bad view, just a little view about what, what might be in there. So it's a big system. And it, we all often think about it as the researchers. That's what we get told. That's science. 
It's the researchers. And maybe we think about it, it's the institutions and also the conferences. Okay, that's sort of science, that's the, what we think. But it's much, much more than that. So we have a huge amount. More scientists are not in universities than mostly in industries of different sorts. Uh, so there are lots and lots of companies who are doing science, and lots and lots of people like patent agents or people who are creating, curating science in different ways, and they're really all part of the science system. Um, then we have this web of knowledge that we've really created. It used to be in paper-based form, and now by and large it's electronic, and this is an amazing resource. So journals, data sets, all, enormous amount of other things that are there in this sort of sphere of knowledge, one might say. And then there's much more about the people we have, people on different levels. We have postdocs, we have fellows, we have institutes, uh, we have facilities in different places around the world. Um, so that's also part of the, the system in a very big way. We have learned societies. Um, then we have funders, so that goes from politicians who are involved in science to large funding agencies who are involved in science, many different sorts of them around the world, to charities as well. And finally, there's this side here, which is really the media side. So, you know, the standard ones, newspaper, uh, magazines, radio, TV, internet, blogs. Um, the role of uh, um, AP, these sort of wire networks, is actually becoming more and more important. So one of the things that's maybe interesting on this side is, uh, yeah, we'll talk about it here, is um, the science that you hear about. How much science do you hear about that's being done. It's something like point, if you're just general public, like me, I, mean, I pick up my biology from reading just general interest stuff, I hear about 0.001% of all the science that's being done. Okay, huge amount of science. Is, there, is it the best 0.001%? Well, who chooses that 0.001%? So that's always what you've got to ask. And so, in fact, there's a, there's a very great narrowing down here. There are very few people who are actually involved in choosing what science we generally hear about. So, and then there's the general public here, so outside. So we can draw sort of a boundary around this, which is all the people involved in the science ecosystem. Now, uh, well, let's start here a second. So we, we often think about the competition in natural ecosystems, and competition is also really all at the heart of a lot of interactions in the science ecosystem. So scientists are, by and large, actually competing with each other very strongly. Part of the weirdness of science, which is completely different from industry, if you invent something in industry, you keep it secret. Right? That's, that's how you make any money. You have a, and it's often know-how. You just don't patent it. You just keep it and you use it. In science, the way that we're paid is in esteem, so we give it all away. So unbelievably competitive because you give away all of your secret knowledge to everybody else and then they can immediately catch up. But universities are competing with each other hugely, as I hope you, you gather. Uh, conferences compete with each other enormously. Your society is competing with lots of other societies in Cambridge. That's, that's full of the science system. Um, learned societies are competing with each other. Uh, funders compete with each other, countries compete with each other, politicians compete with each other, in, um, disciplines compete with each other, uh, you know, research fellows compete with each other. E every aspect around here is driven by very strong competition on one level. And then all of those competitions together make a sort of science system which is connected, but it's got these very tight elastic bands which are always tightening around it. And that's part of, that's what I would say is the reality of the science system now. So you can look at sort of flows around and all these systems. So the public, of course, is in, in the end funding taxation or they're buying products which fund uh, uh, research and development or they're paying into charities. So all of that funds the system and then the lifeblood of the people coming around the system. So in the, I, I started in, you know, looking at how all this works and picking apart some bits of it. And as I said, some bits of it are a bit more interesting and worrying. The number of people involved in passing what gets out to, to the general public in science is actually incredibly small. Um, so anyway, um, yes, we'll go on from there. So this, this is just uh, to come back to my first theme of uh, academics complaining about conferences. Right? So uh, there are some conferences which you know, have that numbers of people in them. There, there are meetings in the US, which I occasionally go to, which have 20,000 people in them. Right? So wh why do we go to conferences? Right? 
So we go to meet somebody. Well, I can meet somebody, but that's not going to be very productive. How do I find the right person? So one of the interesting things for me is that uh, when I ask people about uh, why they go to a conference, they're not really able to articulate what is the reason that they're going. Yeah, part of it is that they have to show what they're doing, so there's a lot of sort of tell. But they, generally, what you really want to do in a conference is meet somebody who's really interesting, doing something different, but you can engage with them on a really interesting level. And almost all conferences are constructed to exactly prevent that. <laughs> because nobody thinks about it. It's not when you're organizing a conference, you have a formula, you just do it the same way. You don't think, how can I get these completely different people to meet at breakfast? By telling them, you're meeting X at breakfast randomly, that's it. And you just go. And you... There are all sorts of ways to do it. Um, but we don't actually use that when we're thinking about building ways for scientists to get together. So uh, that's a really big problem at the moment, is how, how do conferences work? And in fact, the number of conferences is proliferating because the amount of science, uh, the amount of money going into conferences has gone up enormously. So one of the effects of EU funding into science, uh, it forced everybody who got EU grants to actually go at least every six months to another place around Europe to have a meeting with all of the other people in their, in their, conference, in their um, grant. So the number of the conference funding immediately went up enormously. And in fact, there's almost no good statistics on even how many conferences people go to. So anecdotally, everybody will tell you they go to more conferences. But of course, as they're going up through their careers, they will get possibly the ability to go to more conferences. To actually track, are we going to more conferences, is very difficult. You can look at conference attendance, for instance, and that's going up fairly exponentially. Um, but yeah, are they worthwhile? What happens is also there are lots more small conferences, and they sort of stud around the bottom of big conferences. And you'd have thought again, well, maybe it's good that you have more conferences. But if you think about one of the roles of conferences is to connect different disciplines together in different areas that might have synergies but wouldn't otherwise meet, it's actually very bad to have more conferences because it tends to make smaller fragmented disciplines closer together. Instead of going very far across this landscape of different science disciplines, they tend to stay more closely. You have to have really good conference organizers to try and go very broad and to stimulate people from different areas. So there's something very important to actually think about in, actually, um, in conferences. The other place that's also a difficulty is this one of the number of research publications that we produce ever more every year. I mean, I mean the real difficulty is, I think I can remember. So um, it's something like, uh, something like, uh, I think it was something like um, 22,000 new research journals every year. So that's just the journals. And there are about a million papers at the moment published every year. But it goes up exponentially, of course. Slightly faster than the number of scientists go up. Um, and nobody can read them all. And you can't even read a fraction of them. So how are we doing that? And one of the amazing things about it is that scientists use tools that are almost identical to just Google. So when you're looking for some results in a particular area, inevitably you get a flat form list. It's 40,000 records long. And you, know, you look at the first five, right? Or maybe if you're diligent, you go down a few pages. So that surely we can do better in creating tools that curate science knowledge. We have this enormous mass of science knowledge there, but actually we have very few tools to really engage with it. So this is something that also has got to emerge over the next few years. So I'll say a bit more about that. So, um, but the other thing that's really important about this, it grows because I said that we were paid in esteem before. So scientists give away their knowledge and they used to be, you know, I know X and X is fantastic, their ideas are great. But nowadays there's so many scientists, I have never heard of X. Um, oh, but their paper, many people have cited their paper, so now they must be really good. So we have this, I think most people know this, this thing of H factors in the system. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so in some ways, we have esteem wars. That's what I put in the top left corner. So, so scientists uh, you know, argue each other, who's, who's more esteemed? Um, and somehow we've created this system because it's really, really, actually, it's incredibly impressive. This is a system which turns the messy stuff of humans uh, and trying to do things and all of the, the pecking order of, of science 
into something which is actually a very well, a surprisingly well curated body of knowledge. Now, electronic in different ways. And how it does is that is through this sort of amazing pecking order where every time I publish a paper, all the papers I referred to get one extra steam point, if you like. And so the esteem of that author rises, but also the journal's esteem rises. So these journals are all competing with each other to be more esteemed than another journal. And I'm competing to be at the top of that one as well. And we go up and down. And so this thing produces a, a number that we can create, which is called the H factor, which is the number of, it's, it's a number based on the number of citations I've got. And it's, it's quite hard to game the H factor as well. So in some ways, what we do is we put dollars into this system here, pounds into this system here. We put resource in, and it's a way of, uh, for me, it's a way of increasing my H factor. And, uh, but it somehow, miraculously, in that whole process, turns it into some solid knowledge that society can then use. And one of the interesting ways of thinking about this is, is actually scientists have accidentally created the first Bitcoin about 20 years before anybody else did. But they didn't even know they'd do it. <laughs> So this is almost, so age factor is, an, is exactly a Bitcoin. Because every time I publish a paper, then immediately it's, it's spread around and everybody could calculate my age factor because they can all see the citations. And they would all agree on it. So, I mean, there are some subtleties here, but essentially that's the way it works. And um, so, and I have to mine my H factor. So that's a blockchain. It's almost the, the, the scientific literature and the links of citations which is held collectively is exactly what a blockchain is. Everybody would agree on it. And we put resource in to mine this. Okay, it's a much more, I mean, it's a much more useful investment of money, you might say. Uh, but it's created then this Bitcoin and it's a convertible currency. So once I have, high, I have a high H factor, I can increase my salary. Okay, and it's different in different countries as well. So it's an exchange rate of H factors in different countries uh, for dollars. So actually, it's a, an interesting way to think about it um, because, I mean, it, it can make you uncomfortable because it, it, it turns it into a sort of very um, competitive, a very mercantile type of idea. But the other side is it's a way of turning resource into something which is very beneficial for society that we all share. So this thing here is all what we will use in society in different ways. Um, but then you might ask, well, what happens? Well, well, why do scientists feel always this pressure to do more? And then it becomes a bit clearer because as the number of scientists going up goes up 4% a year, then the value of each H factor decreases. It's exactly like infl inflation. So H coin has inflation at 4% a year, and it erodes your esteem. So you have to work 4% harder to be paid the same amount. And that feels very much like what we, the, process, the system that we're in. And then it might, we might think about whether we want what happens when you're in a system where you have runaway inflation and currency crashes. And so how resilient is that system? And the answer is there are some problems down the road. So I think from a lot of these analogies, it's really helpful as a way to think about, OK, what sort of science system do we really want? So we can think about different forms of the future. This is the, I'm nearly finished. So we have a very odd way of deciding what science to fund. If I talk to most people in the public, they assume that in every country there's a set of really the great and the good scientists, and they decide with the politicians what science should be done, and they just tell the experts in the area that's the thing that you're going to work on. And then you say, no, it doesn't really work like that. I think I'm just enjoying what I'm doing, and I think of an idea, and I send it around to some of my friends, and my friends think, oh, that might be a good idea as well, and they say to the people, the politicians, yeah, you should put some money into that idea. And so they give you money. Uh, is it useful for society? I don't know, really. Uh, we said already that you know, it's not very obvious, but it's still not a very obvious system that we, we have. And you can imagine all sorts of ways that our, our science funding system might evolve. So if you think in, in 50 years' time, well, actually, I could think of this in a year's time, to tell you the truth. So I might imagine that um, we look at a lot of proposals for doing some science, and we, we say, well, this lot here are good enough to be funded, but there are far too many to be funded. They need too much money. So how are we going to fund them? So what you're going to have to do is you're now going to go on a game show, which is publicized around the world, and the public who funded the science get to vote. 
which project, right? So then you have very good science communicators who are going to pitch each idea. You start to get consortia of universities around the world, and they hire professional people who will pitch the idea. It's a grand vision. We're going to understand consciousness, right? And as a member of the public, does that, or are you going to cure cancer, or whatever, right? And, I mean, it would just be different. It might be, you know, you might worry about some areas of science in that. But if you could articulate why it's interesting, you could say that might work as a science area. This is a different way you might imagine. So one of the problems is that the people who are deciding about science are completely immersed in the science themselves. It's really hard to be outside the system. So maybe we should become monastic. I don't know. Is it equivalent to nonastic for nuns? I don't know. Um, so you know, you're sequestered away in a, a, a Japanese monastery for six months. If you're a scientist, it's like jury service. You have to go. And then for six months, we are other people. And, and then for six months, you're not doing science. You're thinking about science and these longer-term visions. And you make better decisions. And in fact, you collaborate with the scientists proposing ideas to help develop them. So that's your payback into the science system. That's another system I can imagine. Or it might not be us. So I've talked about the dearth of uh, um, tools for actually understanding this whole web of science that we've been creating. But we're getting better at that, and we should be developing tools. Uh, and I can imagine in 10 years' time, I'm not allowed to put a grant in unless I can say that the AI has told, told me that there really is a space there. There's some conflict and some openness that is not really understood about this idea. It has a score of X, and therefore it's valuable for a grant. Right? Why should I decide? The computer can read all the papers, the AI. Should it be me? I can't do that. So that would be an interesting system as well. So I think we also have got ourselves into a stage where we think there's only one way of doing the sort of evaluation we do, of running the system. And the truth is there are many different ways that we can conceive of that we don't do enough of the experiments on. I'm an experimentalist. Uh, I'm an experimentalist. I like experiments. So we should do these experiments. So I want to... to, to end up here and remind you of a few things. So I hope I've really convinced you that actually this idea of an ecosystem is quite a good way of thinking about science. It, it puts into your head a number of things that you, you think, oh, is this good or is this bad? How do I want this to really work? And the other thing is it's growing very, very fast. So this doubling time of 20 years is just incredibly short. Um, so when I wrote the book, um, I gave it to a number of people to read. And uh, I said, all I wanted to do was to just present, this is how the science system really works. You should understand it if you're a member of the public, because you pay for it. And it's yours. I mean, it's your, 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 yours for society. And everybody said, well, what should we do? I said, it's not my job to tell you what to do. I'm just telling you what the state is. Said, no, you have to say what we should do. So I got forced to actually write a final chapter, which was some ideas of what we might do. Uh, and that's maybe where people started crying. Um, but there are some things that I think are good. Uh, one of the questions I think I'd like to raise is, you know, what's the right number of scientists? If we increase the number of scientists, do we get more science out? And it's not clear to me that that's true. Certainly, there should be an answer to that question. At some point, if all the world, everybody in the world is a scientist, you know, that's the limit, right? So there is definitely an end point to this. But, I mean, fairly likely it's a smaller number of people than, than that who, should, who could be scientists or who benefit the society by being scientists. But how many, and especially since we have Asia investing enormously in scientists, now South America, and eventually Africa, hopefully, will start cultures which really invest very strongly in science. So then the only thing is if we, if we don't want to grow the number of scientists at this huge rate... In the developed countries where we have this very big science infrastructure, we might want to be reducing the number of scientists or transferring scientists or thinking in some way like that. And we, we're nowhere in thinking like that. That's, you know, young scientists in the room will probably attack me. I'm a professor. Maybe we should just be you know, taken away. I think um, the use of uh, AIs to understand, properly understand our web of knowledge is going to become very important. And one of the things that I don't see happening is that becoming uh, a society-sponsored challenge. And I'd very much like to see that. I'm always trying to, um, to promote that. Because it's actually very timely now. Because science is quite a, a formalized system where one could make quite strong progress on that. I think there's a role in that for a new type of career which is we have to create, which is a science curator role. 
So a generation of people who are not necessarily making new knowledge, but curating that knowledge, making the links between different areas. So often as scientists we say, Occam's razor is the greatest tool. So what's the simplest explanation? But I guarantee you, you pick up a copy of Nature or Science or any of these high-impact journals and you look at the papers, it doesn't feel like Occam's razor has been at work. Uh, and, and yet, so it should be part of our process to say, OK, that's an explanation, but is that the simplest explanation that we can get out here? How does that connect to everything that's done? And often what we do is we create very complicated, highfalutin explanations because it sounds you know, more esteemed. That's how we become professors. We learn to, to say those things, I think. Um, I think the problem about metrics, so this idea of H-factor occurrences, we know that money is a very blunt way of measuring people. Uh, and one of the things about the diversity of our cultures is that we have very, very many other ways of measuring people, but we don't reflect it at the moment. So inventing new ways of trying to do those metrics, I think, is going to be important as well, because we need metrics. If I open a position, say so I have my spin-out company wants to hire a really good engineer, and I have a 1,000 applicants, what am I going to do? I have to have some way of filtering it down to a number that I can deal with, and I have to have some way of doing that. So seeing what they've done before, measuring them in some quantitative way is always going to be important. And then finally, I'm a great encourager of creative anarchy. So one of the things I started with was this idea of people that um, they, they, you know, they, they didn't feel they had control over the system. By and large, scientists are not told what to do you know, they decide, they have enormous amounts of autonomy, but yet they don't feel it. Right? They don't like a conference, they complain to me about it, but instead of making a change. So we should all have that sense of that we can actually make changes to the system. I think that's really important to, to have that, because that's the only way that we'll develop enough diversity to have a really healthy and resilient science system. So I hope that's been interesting, and I'm very happy to talk to you afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Jeremy, you don't get away that easily. It's not about talking afterwards, it's about talking now. Um, I haven't been controversial enough. <coughs> oh, I think we can help you with that. Um, so, uh, that was fabulous. Uh, and so infrequently do people engaged in the research enterprise stand back and think about the whole system. So, I thought that was fabulous. I'm not allowed to ask any questions mm -hmm. yet, there's one but here. you are. Um, there's, there's one so, here, over here. Yep, there, there's a system, we've got a system here. Now, when I started this job, uh, everybody used to look at me and I thought it was adulation and regard. And then I realised they just wanted to ask a question. Um, and so I was so upset that I decided that we would change the way we do this. And also I didn't get the right order, so I quickly fell out of, or the audience didn't like the way I did. So we're doing it a much better way now. Um, the uh, gentleman on the left and the lady on the right, sorry, gentleman on the right, you know what I mean. Um, that lady and that gentleman, uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, you have to get their attention, uh, and I will then, in an extremely even-handed way, go from one side to another. Um, so if you want to ask a question, uh, find, uh, catch the attention of one of those two, and then I will go flip, flop, flip, flop, which makes my job terribly easy. Uh, Jeremy doesn't have to wonder who he's going to pick, because it's going to be done for him. So, I, I will start over there, because the lady had her hand up very quickly, and off you go. Um, hi, Professor Baumberg. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I'm, I'm really now uh, interested in reading more about your book and finding out all the data that you're hiding from us. Um, my question is... I'm, I'm a social scientist my, myself, ah, just finished my PhD. So I'm dangerous. wondering, when I'm reading, uh, when I'm listening to your talk, I keep, I keep relating your talk to my own subject because I see a lot of similarities mm -hmm. in between and which makes me wonder to what extent um, is this specifically a phenomenon about the science community or is it a, a phenomenon that's happening in academia in general or mm -hmm. if you think about the broader society we are living in a... Uh, era of knowledge where you were well, previously, like centuries ago, if you have manual labor, you produce things. But now it's really knowledge that is driving the economy and making money. Like that's where all the 
like generations of wealth in the society coming from. And as a result, people have a lot of anxieties about their knowledge. And that's part of the reason why we are seeing uh, expanding mm -hmm. academia nowadays. And uh, I'm wondering whether you have any comments on that, not beyond the science community. Thank yes, you. Um, you might say there's an attention economy, which is competitive in the same sort of way to try and get our attention. Or, you know, the arts community is the same in some ways, very competitive. I think uh, that there are... Well, there are, it's a, I agree there's a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences about the science system as well. So one of them is this sense of that as a science community, we, it has always been set up so that everybody gives away their knowledge. Uh, and that's how they gain esteem and attention. And that's not the way that many other parts of the system work. Uh, so in finance or in, in uh, commerce, you, you try to, privileged knowledge is very, very important. Uh, here, it's not really privileged knowledge that's important. It's sort of being able to get everybody to recognize the knowledge was from you, if it be and then eventually it gets detached from you and just becomes universal. So there's something interesting around that that I think is, is, is interesting. And the other side is also this sort of web of knowledge. So there's something that's being created. It goes from this sort of fuzzy, very human side to something that is very much like our core knowledge as a society. So one of the interesting things people often ask about... Um, you know, don't I worry about some of the fake science that emerges or uh, there are some of the scandals that come out or the fact that there are just some papers that are wrong or unrepeatable around. And generally, it's, certainly, it's not something that I see as a particularly burdensome at the moment because I, also, I almost see this, this, this web of knowledge as really like a tree that just gets accreted. And, you know, knowledge sticks to it and builds out from it. And there are certainly some flaky branches, but they just sort of fall off or they get, they get just get... You know, it's really a substantive s substructure, and it, it won't get chopped down because we, we've used it in so many different ways. It's like amazing architecture. And so that, that's the thing that, that has been created here. And in other domains where you don't feel like have a factual basis, there's not something about the world underneath that underpins it, that means it can go off, lurch off in different directions. There's not this, this big web of knowledge that's keeping us... We, 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 in the end you have to keep true to that web of knowledge. Something that's not true to it will disappear. So that produces, again, I think, some of the differences to the other systems that you're talking about. But I'd be happy to talk afterwards. Do I press this? Should um, scientists have to apply moral judgments to the work they do? Mm. <laughs> we, should, we should talk to a social scientist about this. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I'm, I'm only going to answer for myself because I don't think it's possible to answer for a science community. Uh, my own, I mean, I, I've always worked with a whole range, enormous numbers of different scientists. And uh, I had one colleague when the American uh, US Army came to us and said they wanted to give us a grant. He said, absolutely not. That's the one thing. I never take money from the military. And I was always of the opinion, well, if you take money from the military, they can't use it for something else. Right? So, <laughs> and I, I, I certainly know how to waste money very effectively. Um, but th there is a sense that you give also um, credence. You, you, by taking money, you're, you're giving sort of authority to them as well. So I see both sides of that. It's always impressive to me when somebody has a red line. I have very wavy lines that get pushed around. Uh, so my own view is it's very, very hard to take a moral responsibility for what you do. Uh, it, you, you should always be engaging. I think that's the most important thing. So the sense of hiding away and doing something outside this interaction with our society is a problem. But I think, I think it's better to actually engage and hear you know, views both ways and sort of put the ideas out into the public domain about where your work might lead. So in fact, I, the intelligent toilet is a really good example uh, because uh, it, it, the idea is that it should be helpful for people who have depression. So at the moment, people have depression, have to take drugs the whole time. There's no way of knowing how those are progressing. You need to monitor them. And, and so it actually could be enormously beneficial, but it would also allow your, your employee or your employer to figure out you know, some of your health conditions or your parents to work out if you were smoking cannabis around the bike sheds. Or, so there's always that. Anything that we do has that, that moral dichotomy. So I think, yeah, my view would be it's very hard for scientists to take moral responsibility, except for engaging with society as you're doing it. Um, you talked about how, when you came from industry, being 
uh, surprised, perhaps, that uh, lots of academics complained when they had this wonderful freedom. Having gone through these things about how the system works, mm. do you think that the complaints that lots of academics have are genuine and, and realistic, and, or do you think we're still moaning too much? Um, no, I, I think uh, what I've tried to show you is the pressures that the whole system is under. And the funny thing is that, that the pressure the whole system is under is not being forced on us. So if you ask a department, they have some extra money, what they want to do with it, oh, I want to hire a new academic, right? And that's just creating the problems in the system. They don't say, actually, we should just, you know, we should find another technician who will support the science or something like this. So it's the choices that we very much make that are driving this in the system. So I think the response to that then is that we should become much more aware of how these choices are so, and also have a vision about what sort of science system that we want in the end. Um, then we can complain at that stage because then we know we can do something about it. I, I think that's the only way to do it. So I, I'm still a scientist because I, I think it's a really interesting profession. It's that sense of creativity, problem solving and interest that keeps me going every day. And yet I also still feel that we should find the system that we want to, to make that work. It's enormously productive. But, you know, I would say that, you know, we should, maybe we should just cut the number of scientists by a half. It would take twice as long to do everything and everybody would be twice as happy? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come back. PhD student. No, I understand. And, uh, and I, I guess I'm saying, uh, asking kind of, um, th I don't know, there's a, there's a level to which if you, would, how, how can you disengage from the system when, as you say, you need metrics and the current metrics, which you don't have control over at this stage of a career, um, are fixed and you, you've got to publish and you've got to, you know, get your H factor up and it's, it's true. So there's two things there as well. One of them, you have lots of people in the room who also have industrial background. And often as a PhD student, you have this idea, it's, so, it's impressive in, in industry. Uh, so one of the reasons I always feel I got my job in the university was it, it was trendy to get you know, an industry person. It was so efficient in industry. It does things so spectacularly well. And then when I came to the university, the one thing I told them was, you know, it's so efficient in the university compared to industry. Industry wastes money hand over leg. But when they're making a profit, it's so large, you can waste all that money and still make a profit. Um, so universities have to be, they have to be very lean to actually survive. So it's always easy to feel like this is the only system. In industry, I mean, science and industry has its own pressure. So I have a whole chapter in the book about industry that I didn't have time to talk about. And, you know, it's still part of the science system and a whole lot of other systems as well. Uh, so I think you're always going to be uh, in some sort of system. It's maybe about the amount of autonomy that you really have in your system. Uh, and I think the other thing I was going to say was that people are actually still really important, although I talk about metrics there. Um, it's people who inspire us and people who, in the end, who do support us. And the same is true in industry as well. That's how you really want to hire somebody. You don't really care about the H factor. You, compare, you care about whether they're going to work with you really well. It's going to be a team you're going to interact together really well but I can't talk to a 1,000 people and get that. So how, it's how do we deal with something like that? I want a conversation factor or something. You, know, you have to find a way that I can have a conversation factor. Oh, hi. Um, I was wondering um, if there's been any systematic study of why some, fields of why some subfields of science seem to make more progress and be more useful than others. Ooh, be more useful. Let's talk about pure mathematics, yeah? Uh, so often individuals working for very long times isolated where there are five people in the world who can understand what they're doing. But there have been cases where it turns out to be incredibly useful. So it's maybe in this, this feedback loop here. That feedback loop can be, you know, it can take a long time to go from a simplifier idea suddenly being crucial in a constructor area and vice versa. So the danger is we just decide we're only going to do things that we can see are useful now. And as I showed you with the Nobel Prizes, virtually nothing we do now would have emerged if that was the case. So we have to somehow find a way to fund science broadly. That's, I quite like this, you know, the, the game show way is one way, but maybe that plus a dice so you funded some random things as well. 
Um, it's, it's really, really hard to know how to fund science. So all scientists will complain the fact that they didn't get their last grant. But it's actually much more difficult to decide which of these 100 grants you can give only one to, because they're all great ideas. How do you make that decision? And our aspirations for doing science outstrip our resources for doing science. So it's always going to be political in some way. So it, it's actually political. You're deciding on how to put resources in one place rather than another place. That is a political decision. And scientists don't really like politics. They, they like to believe it shouldn't come into any domain that they're working in. But it's a resource allocation problem, and, and I don't see another way of doing it apart from trying to be diverse. So I didn't answer your question. Um, another question, well, another aspect of the money side of things. Um, scientists may give away their knowledge uh, for esteem, but it's not necessarily distributed um, in the same way. Um, the paid-for journals, um, mm -hmm. the peer-reviewed journals um, that take in this material, um, how would it affect the dynamics of the H factor and also the advancements of science if the paid-for journals were required to take out papers from behind their paywall after a year mm -hmm. and make them uh, public domain? So, I mean, I think all of that is happening. There are lots of pressures to do that. And people have complained about uh, the journals. Generally, scientific journals have one of the largest profit margins of anything in media. It's like 40% or something like that. They're very, very healthy. Um, but I just don't think it's the right... I mean, it, it, there's something about fairness, but actually I don't think it's the real problem with the system. So uh, you have also this pecking order of journals. So... Uh, and that's sort of one of the reasons that this all subsists. So the best science normally gets published in one journal and then you know, gradually it comes down a pecking order. So more people will read it and pay attention to it. And therefore those journals charge huge amounts of money. And because everybody wants to be at the top of the tree, it doesn't change. But there is an enormous service to me of having a pecking order. So if I want to understand an area, I had... I know that I'm going to read better papers and I'm going to read something interesting if I look in a higher impact journal. Not absolutely every time, but generally. So I can't possibly read all the papers, but I can read the few papers in my area that occur in the top journal. I can actually manage to keep track of that. And so it, it helps me enormously. It saves my time. And so my argument is that actually that same, I'm willing to pay a tax to publishers, just who happen to be there having created these journals. I'm willing to pay that tax for my time saving. It may not be a fair tax, but that's not what bothers me. Not paying the tax would be much, much worse. Because if you all, you all published our papers online, it'd be a disaster. Because I need to know which ones to read, and I don't know which ones to read. And, you know, I'd pay somebody to read them now, but then everybody's going to pay people to read them. So it'd be a much more expensive system. So the funny thing is that there's some, there is something very useful that we don't talk about enough. Uh, that is that there's a utility in pecking order and there's a utility in an H factor. If, I, if I'm trying to hire a, a young faculty member and I've got 1,000 people, how am I going to... I can't have 1,000 letters of reference. I can't talk to them or 1,000. I have to winnow it down. So, and, and it's going to be imperfect. It's absolutely not fair. But it is going to give me something which is better than a random thing, and it's going to save my time enormously. So that's the real challenge. And it's possibly where an AI sort of can help us more, or avoiding this one-dimensional metrics that we have at the moment. So I think that's my real argument. I think we have to do more on AI-type approaches and more on uh, other metrics to change the way that we see pecking orders. They're no longer one-dimensional. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned talking about the sort of tree of knowledge and learning papers, and there are a few that are just wrong, and those branches drop off. They just drop off. Mm -hmm. You'll probably be aware of a couple of papers in 2012 when two industry groups actually tried to replicate um, a number of very high-impact biomedical uh, results and found that 75% of them were irreproducible, mm -hmm. or as the general public would call, wrong. Um, and I'd have talked to a number of uh, pharma and biotech company people at the same time, and they said they'd found exactly the same thing, they just hadn't bothered to publish it. So on that basis, do you think the answer to your first question up there should be uh, yes, we should fire 75% of them because they're producing junk? 
But which 75% is the difficult thing? <laughs> so I, I would suspect that none of the papers, because they were high-impact papers, and they're normally quite well refereed, none of them was intentionally misleading. They were more optimistically misleading. So they'd seen results which they believed. They could have spent another five years checking them to make sure that they were actually incorrect. But there was this strong pressure to get them out there. And it is often true. I mean, uh, students who start out in science often say, well, I just can do that paper, and I can connect it to that paper, and I'll do that, and I'll do this great discovery. And it's like, uh, uh, yeah, that's not how it works. Because we all start to get a feeling for, I can depend on this group's work, or this group's work is always a bit over-optimistic in this way. And so you read... So there's something about how you approach that literature as well. And it does vary from different fields. So biomedical is much worse. And biomedical is worse just because it's so much less reproducible. And it, it may indeed be just this particular batch of cells, cell lines that this work was done on, compared to the standard set of cell lines. So there was something slightly contaminated. And that's generally been accepted as at the basis of these, these problems. Um, so I think uh, it does vary with areas. But on the other hand, I still think... It's, it's helpful to have that uh, because it gives you a guide sort of where people are trying to go. Often something is done and it's too early. It's not really ready, but actually other people start working into it and it becomes more robust. The ideas start being put out there, even if the original ideas were wrong. So it, in fields a bit closer to mine, there was a great fraud at Bell Labs in the mid-2000s from a guy called Heinrich Schoen. Uh, who produced a huge number of high-impact papers in a year, and everybody thought he was a fantastic scientist. He just made them all up. Uh, it was really amazing uh, that it wasn't spotted. It only spotted when... He, he just been, it's amazing when people do this. They invent stuff, but they don't bother to invent new noise curves. So, you know, in different papers, different things measured happen to have exactly the same noise curves because the random number generator was the same. Bizarre. So, incredibly smart guy, but not in falsification. Um, <laughs> But, so, so many people in that area, so this is making molecules do electronics. So a single molecule could be your transistor. Very clever idea. Uh, and many people in the field thought, that's terrible now. Nobody's going to ever fund the field again. It's all going to be contaminated. But in my view, it's like, you know, all, all media coverage is good coverage. Because you, you're winning in the attention economy. So the idea is now more out there. And actually, nobody really, you know, you remember it, but it actually doesn't tar the field. There's still lots and lots of interesting things going on in that field, and it gives a vision. I mean, that is where you could go. We just don't quite know how to do it. So there's something about that that I think is also important. So I'm, I'm a quite an optimistic person, so I'm not as unhappy about having that in the literature. It will eventually shed, and those trees will become robust, and you can see it in a lot of areas of science. So sometimes we have to develop tools to help us do that, and it's, that sort of evolves. But it worries me personally less. Maybe some biomedical researchers will disagree. Hi. Um, at the beginning of the evening, you spoke a little bit about simplifiers and constructors. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether you could say a little bit more about... Uh, the way that I understood what you were saying is perhaps um, the simplifiers were sort of trying to make sense of the world and making discoveries. Uh, constructors were perhaps more like... It, they, were, they were inventing things, perhaps, and maybe... Uh, I, I, and I suppose I'm interested, is it sort of inevitable that... Because you talked about the balance changing and perhaps having um, many more simplifiers maybe a century ago and now turn to sort of 50-50 perhaps. And is it inevitable that over time maybe we'll get more constructors, fewer simplifiers? What is the driving force that, um, I suppose, um, yeah, motivate scientists to become constructors rather than simplifiers. Yeah, so it's a really interesting area as well. So I haven't, I haven't really seen science discussed so much in this way, which surprised me. I try to look in the social science literature, for instance, on science, and there's not, there's not so much written about some of these areas. Um, so uh, there was a book published about uh, five years ago which sort of talked about the end of science. So we're running out of ideas and you know, new things. We're just filling in the details. And it caused a storm of protest. Um, and I think one of the reasons is exactly this, that since the idea, most of the public think that science is simplifier science, because that's what's sold to them. Uh, there's the sort of, you know, we're understanding the genome, we're understanding things. And then by, as a byproduct, there's some miracle things come in their black boxes that everybody buys. But they're very hazy about the process with which 
one bit connects to another bit or if it does. So this idea of constructors it doesn't really seem to be in the general public's idea of what a scientist might be doing. Uh, and I think that's the saving grace. I think probably it's right we're going to be, you know, the easy problems that are available in our scales are going to be done because we're quite good at working out science, but the constructor ones will just carry on forever. So that's an ever changing balance. But on the other hand, we don't still yet know how to build a planet from scratch. Or, you know, there are some huge things that we have no idea of. In 20,000 years, who know what we'll do? So I, I don't think we're, simplify our problems will go away completely at all because there's so much that we don't know. I was trying to show that in the nanoscience area. You know, we, we really don't know stuff. It's going to take me the rest of my career because we're, we're really bad at this sort of thing. So it's easy to maybe see all the wins and forget, forget all the things that we're really quite bad at. Um, but, yeah, I think there is an evolution. Now, um, we're um, a bit concerned about the clock. So uh, Just how off. many people have you got? Three. three. I'm going to suggest uh, that we take three quick questions and get you to answer. Uh, Quickly. The, and, and then we'll go to the other side. And how many have you got, John? Two. OK. So can I ask the three people on this side uh, to do their questions in quick fire succession? And you're going to have to hold these in your mind, Jeremy. It's not going to be easy. The uh, audience will help. Go. So, um, we're at the onset of the sixth uh, mass extinction of species. Does climate change threatening the planet? Uh, does massive inequality in the world? Um, rebellion is very hard because there are some, there's a subset of the population that have weapons, like police officers, army, that maintain the status quo. Atomic bombs have happened, there's spying oppression in uh, undemocratic countries. 50% uh, right of languages are endangered and will likely die out this uh, coming century. And um, I'm asking. Um, well, uh, I, I think science is at the, the root of all these things, and I'm asking you whether you have explored whether science is good. Okay, hold that thought. Number two science on the good. side, please. Is science good? Uh, hello, thank you for your talk this evening. Um, in scientific research for the past, I don't know, hundreds of years, serendipity has always played a part, and there are so many um, applications of science that are used in our day-to-day -day lives that have been discovered accidentally. And I, f I think serendipity is um, driven by chance. So what do you feel about more scientists means a higher likelihood of discovering something? Okay, okay. last one on this side. Apologies to those who we've missed. This is by far the easiest one, so. <laughs> 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 Okay, so I was just wondering whether you could say something on um, what science curators should do exactly. So mm -hmm. you said something about science communicators not not being there, not there being enough science communicators, and I was wondering if you had someone else in mind, and also if you could just comment very briefly on um, the metric of impact that it seems to be becoming more and more prominent, and whether you think it's a good one and it's working. Okay. Uh, is science good? Uh, it just depends on your point of view. It's re that's a really, really hard uh, question. Um, so the answer is very simple. No, I did not consider that in my book. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about it in the bar afterwards. Um, science gives the potential to, to our societies. And uh, we could go back to a small number of people living a much more sort of animal-like life. Um, but in fact, that misses out also a lot of the things we value in our societies. So these ideas and intellect. And so the question is, can we have both of those things or not? And that's, that's hard to answer that question. So that's all I'll say on that. Uh, then there was serendipity. So uh, I agree that chance is important in scientists, but that's only a small ingredient. Because all of those scientific discoveries happened because people were trying to do something. And they often had an idea, an intuition about what they should be seeing. And they spotted that something weird is going on. So it's actually, serendipity only happens to a prepared mind. 
It doesn't happen to somebody blinding around. So there's lots of other stories of people who never discovered anything. They, they just blinded, blundered past it. Most of my graduate students are like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I try, yeah. So it's easy to think chance is very important. Um, but it is important as well, but only in a prepared mind. And so I, I don't think then you disagree with anything here. Uh, and then science curation, the sort of things I can imagine are actually, you know, these are people who would be great to run conferences because they would stand up and say, you know, this is completely bullshit. It's completely irreproducible. Right? We know that. There's been these eight studies, and they list the studies. So why is that? That's a very confident science curator. Um, <laughs> but there are other science curators who would be involved in the grant process and say, well, really, this is a worked-out area. You can see this whole map. and They'd be very much visualizing science for scientists. You know, I would be happy to, to pay somebody to do this if I was allowed to do that. But no, no, exactly. So, exactly, we have to create that as part of our system to see that this is something that will help enormously. And uh, I think there's also a lot of people who would find enormous reward from that career. So you don't, you know, it's like we need a, a whole diversity of different people within science. That's something that's really missing from science at the moment, I think. Right. So, right, now left. Left hand. So um, you mentioned the use of AI for funding. Um, I want to ask that, uh, given we know that it's difficult to judge the usefulness of basic research, not to mention the return, what should the algorithm be maximizing? Ah. Like, and also, uh, <laughs> even if we have such an algorithm and we can tell the whole world the top priority of research funding, like, doesn't that just worsen the monoculture of science posed by globalization that you mentioned at the beginning. So one thing that's... Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to wait. Yep. Yeah, all right. Hello, Professor. Uh, recently, it seems that the percentage of theoretical physicists um, awarded Nobel Prize is decreasing. And some, some people think that it is because um, nowadays and theoretical physics, such as stream theory, is too advanced that um, it is almost impossible to be uh, proved or disproved according to, uh, based on the, um, the technology on nowadays. And so what's your comment on the relationship between uh, um, theoretical physicists and uh, experimental physicists now? Thank you. Okay. Experimental versus theoretical. Uh, the first one, remind me the first one, the rest of the audience. First question was... Algorithm. Oh, yes, what's the algorithm, right? So the first interesting thing about that is that um, there's, as far as I know, very few studies that look at all of these grant panels to work out what it is that's making one grant succeed over another. How are these panelists choosing? Because they're effectively doing that. Uh, is it just because it's better written? I mean, there are various things about it. Is it about the quality of the diagrams? Is it where the science is going? And how, how it's very hard to do the control experiment, right? Uh, so, but, but nowadays, actually, we can more because many societies fund the same science in different ways. I, I see endlessly the same thing going on. So actually, that's probably the place that I would start with my algorithm. There's lots of data, and I would see how we're making decisions at the moment, and then I would try and tweak the system to see how it should go. Um, so I think it's, it's not that you can just build an AI and it's simple. I think really the thing to first build is how we can build an AI that understands this domain of science knowledge, that can pass the literature. But we know that that's possible. It's, it's, a, it's a highly you know, complex space, but it's still a relatively constrained space in many, in many ways. So it's about, if you like, how does an AI have an intuition? What model is the model that the AI is building. So that's somewhere that I would start. So I think it's a very, I mean, it's a long-term project. It's a multi-decade project, but it needs sort of strong funding to bring it out. And you don't really see discussion of it. Theoretical physicists and the demise of theoretical physicists. Um, so, I mean, for me, I, I really like the idea that science has to be testable. Otherwise, it's just art. Uh, sorry, not just art. It's very interesting art, but it's not science. A that's where I'd say the distinction is. But it's very hard to say that it's always going to be that way because, you know, we learn how to uh, uh, use, you know, large-scale um, particles, say, cosmic rays coming in, enormous energies to actually tell us about something we could never build on Earth. So there's always clever ideas that we have to start testing some of these domains. And... We need theoretical physicists to define those domains to say, oh, well, that actually excludes this whole set of theories, and gravitational wave detection has, always, has also been something a bit like that. So maybe the real question is, what's the right number of theoretical physicists that we should have? 
Yeah? They're quite cheap, theoretical <laughs> physicists. So they're always popular from that way, but they're also expensive because they generate lots of arguments in departmental faculty meetings. <laughs> so that's the balance that we have to figure out. Uh, but but that, that is a real question, and it's not one that we as generally societies ask. We don't say, you know, how many theoretical physicists should be, how many physicists versus chemists. Uh, I once spent a whole weekend uh, in the countryside in Britain in a lodge with a lot of very, you know, very smart people trying to figure out what was the way we could take the UK science budget and make some sensible algorithm that would divide it in the amount of money to physics and the amount of money to chemistry. We spent two and a half days and we came up with the answer, you just split it as it historically split, because every other way generates enormous arguments that you can't really justify. So, um, but it, it is something that we have to grapple with a little bit in this context. So it's a good question. Thank you.